further ado, let's open in prayer and then uh, we'll start digging in. All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity to come together as the men of this congregation. We pray your blessing upon uh, our time together. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you will give to us wisdom and understanding and that you will bless our congregation. We thank you, Lord, for the varying ages of men that are here represented, uh, for those that have served and those who have yet to serve. We pray, Lord, that you will use this in the life of our congregation to bless, edify, and strengthen us as a church so that we might continue to go forward and be edified uh, by you, even as you, by your Spirit, lead and guide us into truth. And so, Father, we ask and pray your blessing upon our evening, that you will hear us for Christ's sake alone. Amen. Hey, Arian, come on in. There's, uh, there's some material back there. If you want to grab that, that would be uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, basically what we're going to be doing here is I have a PowerPoint um, and I'm going to hopefully use this to keep me on track. And not only hopefully will my notes keep me on track, but I have a clock right in front of me that tells me how much time I'm spending on each slide and how much time we have left. So um, I do have a clock, believe it or not. So you see me not looking at my watch it's because it's staring right at me. Anyway, the reason why this all came about was because of the fact that within the consistory and also within the educational committee, we've noticed that there uh, is an increasing decline uh, in willing volunteers uh, in the life of the church for, for service. Not even volunteers, you know, broadly speaking, but specifically addressing the whole nature of offices. And so with this, this, uh, this recognized decline in volunteers, we've been saying to ourselves, we need to do something, we need to address this and not just complain about it, but we need to actually address this and do something for this. Along with this, there was an increased burden or an increasing burden for educated volunteers. And again, I'm talking in the context of volunteers uh, within the context of, of office bearers. And that there is a link between these two ideas. But that we develop a format for ongoing and increasing in-depth education. Because we believe that through an in-depth education, so that's why the room is set up as it is. For example, you'll note we're not just sitting at round tables, but it's very much like a, like a, a, a room, a classroom type situation, so that we understand that this isn't just coffee klutzing time, even though we do have coffee and you have a klutz here, but um, that, that the purpose of this, though, is the fact that we are trying to be educated and that we have a burden and that we take this seriously and so that even the environment in which we find ourselves is one of an educational nature. So you have a classroom curriculum, you have a workbook, you have your Bible, you have the Psalter hymnal, not because we necessarily plan on singing, that might not be a bad idea, but for the confessions that we have in the back. So that we understand that there is a link between education and even the willingness of volunteers. We're gonna develop this in time, just trying to, to um, unfold this for you. So that we cultivate a leadership pool from which to nominate elders deacons. Um, Reverend Postman and I were just on uh, uh, a conference call this afternoon uh, along with Jill and we're looking at some church software. Those of you who are on council that will be addressed soon enough. But it was interesting that he, he in going through different men of the congregation in a database and how you can keep track of the database and so on and so forth and the people in your church. One of the things that he brought up is like if you have any kind of office bearer training class, you can mark that they've attended the office bearer training class or that they haven't and what kind of classes that they've taken in the church and what kind of level of participation so that you can form an aggregate list of all the men in your church that have taken said classes and then he started developing, you know, and this is just a guy from Ventura, California that we were talking to, very much talking about the very thing that we're hoping to do here, that we cultivate a leadership pool so that it's not just office bearers. And by the way, I'm impressed to see a number of the younger guys here. Thank you very much for showing up. But that we cultivate a leadership pool from which we begin to nominate elders and deacons, volunteers, quote unquote, so that we have educated and therefore then more apt to be willing volunteers because you know what you're getting yourself into and you understand what's going to be involved so that you're not in the deep end and you've never even had a swimming lesson in your entire life, which oftentimes is how it feels. I'm sure many of you would say 
if you've come into office, you do feel very much like you're in the deep end. You're, you're struggling to just come to grips with what the council or the consistory is dealing with, let alone the responsibilities that you have in the context of that. So the outline that we have for tonight then, what we want to hopefully try and get through, and uh, it might be a bit ambitious, but uh, we will cut off when we need to cut off. And by the way, Jason said I might need to leave earlier um, than this. And if others of you have to leave, again, we're not offended. So Jason, if you need to go, whatever, whoever needs to go, we understand. That's again why we want to make this available on YouTube. Um, John, you can't go yet though. You got to at least stay for five minutes. Coffee's not even done yet. Um, but, but we know that you guys are busy men, a lot of schedules uh, here. We are too. We recognize that. Anyway, be that as it may, this is what we're hoping to go through. Our pastoral purpose, and then underneath the pastoral purpose, the three purposes uh, that develop our introduction, and then a proposed pattern that goes into the nature of the church order. So the first pastoral purpose that we're going to be looking at this evening is to confront the new problem, which come to find out is the old problem, and you don't even know what the, old, the, the problem is yet. Okay, well, we'll introduce that in a moment. Then we want to do um, and focus on, in terms of our pastoral purpose, the second one, which is that we conduct a taught ministry for a caught ministry. Okay, so just some play on words there. And then the third pastoral purpose that we want to look at is that we construct an intentional foundation for a long-term vision. So the first thing that we want to do then is confront the new problem, which is the old problem. And I should also say, if any of you have a question, a comment, anything you want to say, put your hand up, recognize everything else. Reverend Postman and I have put this uh, together and uh, certainly couldn't have done this uh, without him. I just happen to be the one you're staring at and listening to right now. Um, but uh, um, definitely he's not even here right now as I make this comment, but uh, he's going to have feedback at various points. But if you have feedback at various points, uh, please feel free uh, to chime um, in. So the current observation that we have, the challenge that we see ourselves facing is not necessarily a question even of willingness, but a question that relates to equipping. And from this lack of equipping, from this lack of education, this lack of focus in education, what we've seen developing is not just a decline in volunteers, but a decline in volunteers that's really rooted in a kind of insecurity. That's what we've identified as a consistory, as we've talked about an education committee, as we formed a, an, an ad hoc committee out of the education committee to look at this. One of the things that we've noticed is it seems as though there is an insecurity. There is a personal insecurity with some individuals. Um, I don't know that it's uh, really my cup of tea. I don't know if I'm able to do this. I'm not sure that I should do this. I'm I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that, right? Something that's rooted to their person. That's one of the aspects of the insecurity that we've noticed. Another is a kind of, um, if I can put it this way, official insecurity. That there's an insecurity that's rooted in the office. Well, and, and this is sometimes how we hear it. And if you have said it, I'm not trying to be offensive to you. I'm not mocking you when I say this. Um, so please take it in the spirit in which it's said. But, but we've heard sometimes it said, well, I could see myself serving as a deacon, but there's no way I could ever serve as an elder. The, no, no way. And you go, well, why not? Well, because the elder, I mean, that's just this, this big, massive office, and, and I, I don't know. I don't know that I could ever do that. Or someone says, I could definitely serve around the church, but I don't think there's any way I could ever be a deacon. So that there's this kind of what I'm calling insecurity of office, that it comes from an, an official um, understanding of the office. And it sounds pious, but what ends up happening is that it becomes very paralyzing. It paralyzes the individual, and the more individuals that it paralyzes, it can quickly paralyze the church. So that's our current observation, is that there is an insecurity. And what we want to focus on in a first part here is that the new problem that we're identifying as insecurity, come to find out, it's not really that, that new of a problem. When someone comes and says, mm, I don't know about the office, or they, they start focusing on themselves, I don't know about me, uh, come to find out that as a matter of fact, uh, the Bible has a lot to say on this particular issue because it is an old problem. So what we want to do for just a few moments is look at various uh, passages in Scripture that relate to calling. 
And that's why even if I could maybe redo my notes, initially when I talked about volunteers, in one sense it's a volunteer. Um, are you willing, are you able to help out? But in another sense, in a much stricter sense, and probably more appropriate sense, we're talking about calling. And we'll develop this, this word, this language as we go on. But we're going to look at different uh, callings that we have uh, from Scripture. So first of all, we want to look at Moses. The calling of Moses. Because the what? The new problem is the old problem. So let's go all the way back to Moses. And what do we think of when we think of Moses? Think of a mighty man. I just kind of threw some words down. Uh, on, on the screen here. We think of a mighty man, a strong man. Uh, you think of someone who is a, is a great leader, very much uh, a great leader, bold, courageous. Um, I know that these are kind of moralistic uh, terms and everything else. But what do we find when we look at Scripture? We might think of, of a lot of these terms, but the, but the challenge that we have oftentimes as we come to Scripture is that we elevate the biblical characters to a level uh, that we ought not to. Oh, David, he was the best of the best. Well, when you start digging into it, you go, uh, he is a man with a lot of warts. And as you come to Moses, oh, well, he's the mighty man, great leader, bold, courageous, that, that, the other, right? What do we find? Well, Exodus 3, uh, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So what does he identify there? What, what, what's he saying the problem is? What, what's he rooting the problem in? Or what challenge does he see? Go ahead, Steve. That's right. So it's a personal thing. He's like, ah, it's not me. I'm not worthy of this. I, 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 can't, I can't do this. Uh, there's no way, right? I'm not the man that you're looking for. Next, Exodus 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered. Well, to whom did he answer? Well, he's having a dialogue with the Lord at this point. Then Moses answered the Lord and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So what's he doing? He's coming up with all kinds of objections that he has to the Lord. What if I don't get results? What if I'm not respected? What if they don't believe me? What if they won't listen to me? Sound familiar? If, if you've served in office and if you've ever gone through a nomination process, this probably sounds familiar to you. It's a dialogue that oftentimes happens. Here it is, though, genuinely, properly between Moses and the Lord. But God, I mean, what happens if they don't listen to me or believe me? Okay, keep going. Then Moses said to the Lord, why do we keep going? Well, because the dialogue keeps going. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Exodus 4.10. So put this into your own words. What is, what is Moses saying at this point? What's he saying? Can't do it. Okay, can't do it. Why can't he do it? Okay, not a good speaker, but more broadly, how would you put it? Not equipped. I don't have the gifts. I don't have those gifts. There are other people that have those gifts. Those people have the gifts. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the gifts. So he's not gifted. And I find most remarkable, he says, even since you have started talking to me, you still <laughs> don't equip me. That's true. <laughs> he kind of blames God. That's good. You can't do anything that make it. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that great? Good, good observation. Yeah, you've been trying, Lord. I'll give you credit. Thank you, but didn't help. Didn't help. Okay, so I don't have the tools, and I don't really think that I'm being helped all that much. So, go find someone else. I'm not your man. Okay, new problem, old problem. But he said, "Oh my Lord." Please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So, I mean, this is a beautiful dialogue, isn't it? Because Moses is relentless, relentless. Yeah. But he says, listen, whoever else you want to send, I'll support him. 
as long as it's not me. Okay? Moses is calling. Okay, next, let's go to Isaiah's calling. Because it'd be easy if we just said, well, it was just one, you know, one guy, it's Moses. But what about Isaiah's calling? And again, you think of Isaiah, you think of one of the great prophets. Uh, some of the great passages that we have come from um, the prophecy of Isaiah. And yet, what do we find in the midst of Isaiah's calling? Um, we have this language. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 5. Now again, this is of a different nature, this is of a different caliber than what we read of with Moses. Moses, there seems to be this kind of obstinate rejection, I'm not gifted, I'll support the other guy, it's not me, they won't believe me. Uh, this is definitely one of sincerity. Um, and, and I don't want to question the sincerity of Moses either. But, but here is one where he, the prophet, has just seen in the vision the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm too much of a sinner. I, I am just too much of a sinner to be able to do that. I'm a man of unclean lips and look at where I come from. So there is this hesitancy that we see in Isaiah. Then we come to Jeremiah and Jeremiah's calling, another one of the great bold prophets that we have. And he says, Jeremiah 1.6, again, notice we're not very far into these books, a resistance and a hesitancy and a kind of insecurity. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am, what? Young. I am too young. I am too young. And I think that's a two-way street, by the way. I think the Apostle Paul addresses this, and we're glad that the Apostle Paul addresses this with Timothy. Don't let anyone despise your youth. Young people, young men, you have some young men, don't despise your youth. Old men, don't despise their youth. Because I think we can despise our own youth and our own immaturity, but we can also tell our young people to despise their youth and their immaturity. Well, they're obviously too young to serve in office. Okay, look at what he says. Lord God, behold, I can't speak. I'm just a, I'm just a young guy. Get someone who's older. Get someone who is more experienced, not me. <coughs> the next one that we have is John Mark, and, and this one is born out of the study that we did in the book of Acts. And again, maybe some fit others, uh, others fit better than, than um, some of the other ones. Moses is probably the best illustration, but I did like uh, John Mark, so I put this in here. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work, Acts 15, uh, 38. Do you, do you remember what, what had happened, what had transpired uh, in this situation? Do you remember why? John Mark, why that was a problem. I mean, it kind of says it here, I guess, but that, uh, that they took him. He was young. He kind of uh, hopped along on the, on the mission trip. And then it would appear that when the, the going got tough, he said, I need to go and be back with my mom. And Paul says, we cannot have this kind of uh, failure on the mission field. No, Barnabas, we are not taking him with us. He does not deserve to come with us. And, of course, what did Barnabas say? You remember? He took yeah, Barnabas said, um, sorry, Paul, but he is coming with us. And at that point, you have the split, the breakup between Paul and Barnabas. They go different directions, um, somewhat peaceably. Um, there was definitely a rift. Um, but, but Paul said he is not qualified. And the qualification or the disqualification at this point is rooted in a kind of, and this is why it's maybe a bit of a stretch, but a, a, a kind of insecurity. I'm not secure in the fact that he's going to be able to stick with it. He has an asterisk by his name. He's made mistakes before. We don't want this kind of guy. But Barnabas, having worked with him, said yes. Uh, we take him. And of course, what ended up happening, just quick, we, we skip along. What ended up happening with John Mark? Was it a good thing that Barnabas took him along? Yes. 
Later on, Paul would say, send Mark that he might come minister to me. Mark, of course, would be the writer of the gospel of Mark. So you have this beautiful situation where Barnabas did what Paul should have done, didn't do, stuck with him. He goes forward. Anyway, having said that, having said all of that, I want to do a little bit of what we're calling here in our notes collective analysis because we don't want to poo-poo the reasons that many people give and sound as though there should be no hesitation. And so if there's anyone that has any hesitation about being an office bearer or anything else, well, we don't want them because they have hesitation. And, And so what I'm calling here the collective analysis, there should be a kind of hesitation in one sense before anyone entertains the idea of coming into into office. Why? Because it is an awesome responsibility. I I mean awesome in in its more um, original sense that it's that which should fill us with awe. It's awful. It's an awful responsibility. It is an awesome responsibility. Why is it that? Well, because of the fact of what it is, because of what it means. I forgot that I had this quote here. This is a quote that I found from the, from the diary of Robert Murray McShane. As a matter of fact, I found it when I was probably about, I don't know, 19 years old, um, 18 years old, some, somewhere in there. Um, and, and I marked it, and I, and I wrote in the, the, the notes to myself, memorized, and I didn't. And so here I am, 41, and I still don't have it memorized, but I still remember it. Um, but June 25, 1832, and he wrote this in his diary. How apt we are to lose our hours in the vainest babblings, as do the world. How can this be with those chosen for the mighty office? Fellow workers with God, heralds of his Son, evangelists, men set apart to the work, chosen out of the chosen, as it were the very pick of the flock, who are to shine as the stars forever and ever. Alas, alas, my soul, where shalt thou appear, O Lord my God? I am a little child. So those are the words that he wrote on the 25th of June, 1832. He saw the awesome responsibility, and I remember this, and and it could sound arrogant if not understood in the right way. The chosen out of the chosen, as it were, the pick of the flock. What, What we do when we nominate office bearers, we are looking for the best of the best in the congregation, which is not meant to fill those of you who are in office, and I'm in office, is not meant to puff us up, we're the best and we rock and we're... No, but we need men that are genuinely converted to God. One of the things in Scotland, by the way, Robert Murray McShane is a Scotsman, one of the men, some of the men in Scotland were saying, I know of consistories where you have multiple men who are on the consistory, the session, who are not even converts. They don't even believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're just a part of the church, just because. It's just their custom. But we need the best of the best. So it's an awesome responsibility. And I, I always think of this quote. I think it captures the awesomeness of the responsibility quite well. Why an awesome responsibility? Because we handle God's word. Not just ministers that handle God's word. Every one of the offices handles God's word. And when I say this, again, my idea is not to intimidate people. Go, man, um, had the opposite effect. It's not making me more willing to be a servant. It's making me less willing to be a servant. No. Okay, let's be sober about what this is and then derive our strength in just a few moments. But let's be honest. We handle God's word. The deacon handles God's word. The elder handles God's word. The minister handles God's word in different ways, in different capacities. But we're all the handlers of God's word. I think of this passage in this context from 2 Peter. And it says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Take heed as a light that shines in a dark place, that you recognize what it is that you're handling. You also recognize that it's not of any private interpretation, but rather that we are in a rich history and tradition. It's not just what I happen to think, right? But that God, go back to the word perspicuity from Sunday evening, but that God's word is clear and we bring that clear word to God's people because that's the word that we handle. And of course, then um, we bring God's word. Not only do we handle it, we we bring it. 2 Timothy 2, 14. 
remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord. Right? There's a bringing component to the word that we remind them and we charge them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit. Why in the world are you guys arguing about the coloring of the, of the carpet? Why, that does not matter. Right? That's what the apostles here are talking about. Timothy, you cannot let these people go on and on and on about why we have a charcoal grill for family night instead of a gas grill. And it's, it's, it's a problem in the church. That there's no profit in this. So that's where we bring God's word. We say, brothers, this is not what we burn capital on. Uh, now I'm starting to preach here, but, but it seems to me that we spend and piddle away so much kingdom resource. And I can say this because we don't have little kids present, on the stupidest things. He says, no, you bring God's word. It's an awesome responsibility. Therefore, don't strive about things of no profit to the ruin of the hearers. And people go, see, this is exactly why I hate the church. Exactly why I hate the church. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, it goes back to the fact you're not having a hobby horse. You're not riding that, but rather... There you go. You bring the word. Okay, we speak God's word. Maybe there's overlap. Obviously, these, these points aren't they're not separate from each other. They're, they're connected. You, you handle it to bring it. You bring it to what? To speak it. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So, that's how we speak the word. Even so, we speak. Which doesn't mean, by the way, that you know that you've spoken the word when you tick someone off. <laughs> well, they're obviously not pleased. I guess I've done my job. Of course not. Obviously, I hope that you're discerning enough to recognize that, uh, that the way that we speak the word is important. Having said that, it's not to make people comfortable per se. It's to be faithful. We do it for the approval of God. Okay, so... The collective analysis from a lot of this then generates what we've been calling here, let's stay on point, what we're calling insecurity. Because we handle it, because we got to speak it, because we got to bring it, I don't know that I'm that person. I mean, you got to understand, I work with concrete all day, or you got to understand, I, I, I stare at a computer monitor all day, or you got to understand, I do this or I do that. I, this isn't, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't see it. So, from the insecurity can come an intimidation, and from the intimidation comes certainly some understanding, because that's what we see in Scripture. So then, what is the corrective for this paralysis? We see the analysis of the responsibilities, but how are you going to correct then the paralysis that can develop out of this? Well, here again, let me go to this... Uh, this, uh, this uh, quotation from the diary of Robert Murray McShane, because I didn't finish it. 1832, alas, alas, my soul, where shalt thou appear? O Lord God, I'm a little child, but thou wilt send an angel with a live coal from off the altar and touch my unclean lips and put a tongue within my dry mouth so that I shall say with Isaiah, here I am, send me, that should be. Send me. And by the way, I don't know if you're impressed with that quote at all or not, but he, he was 19 years old when he wrote these words. Um, he actually died at a very early age. But uh, certainly he understood that the corrective for the paralysis comes with the but thou wilt. But thou wilt send an angel with a live coal. So what is the corrective? We need to understand that we have been redeemed. How do you correct the intimidation, the paralysis, the insecurity? We start with the basics. You always go back to the basics. I don't know a lot of things, and, and I might not know how to do this, and I might not know how to do that, but, but I'm going to start with the basic. And I know this. I know that I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So let's go back to the insecurity that we read about in Isaiah 6. 
that Robert Murray McShane actually points us to. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. Notice how this answers Isaiah's particular challenge. He recognized the fact that he is a man of unclean lips. What does the Lord do to answer that in terms of his calling? He cleanses him. He purifies him. We've been redeemed. We've been cleansed. So the Lord says, yes, of course you're a sinner. I remember one of the first, uh, this is totally off script, but I still have the clock, so I, I, I do pay, take notice of that. But I remember one of the first conversations Jody and I ever had were dating, and uh, I was involved in all kinds of sins. We won't have to talk about that. But I remember Jody saying, do you really think you should go into the ministry with some of the challenges that you've had and some of the sins that you've committed and some of the things that you've done? Do you really think, and we're like 18, 19 years old again somewhere in there, do you really think that it's good for a person or people like us? I mean, we are not like Reverend Cray. You know, we are not like these holy men that we see around us that are ministers. Do you really think that that's for us? And maybe, I don't know if that's where you've been in terms of office before, but I remember very vividly having that discussion with Jody in a very intimate discussion. Should someone who has committed sins, and I'm like, wow, I've committed, yeah, I've definitely committed sins. I mean, I probably use the Lord's name more in blasphemy before uh, I was uh, 19 years old than I, than I ever did in praise, um, right? So, uh, yeah, how could that name come from my lips in honor when it's so often come from my lips in, in dishonor? There it is. We've been purified. Okay, so next. We've been equipped. We've been equipped. Okay, but the Lord said to me, do not say, I am young. Guess who we're talking about here? Do not say to me, I am young. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of their faces. For I am with you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. So, what does God do? God says, I'm going to hear your objection, which, which I find a, a very comforting thing. God doesn't say to us when we bring our objections, shut up, I don't want to hear it. He doesn't say that to us. What does he say? He says, you know, don't say I am young. Why? Because I hear what you're saying. I get where you're coming from. I get your insecurity. I'm not going to mock your insecurity. Rather, what am I going to do? I'm going to, the word, equip. I'm going to equip you in the midst of your insecurity. I get the fact that you don't have the resources. I get that. I totally understand that. And that's why, whatever I command you, Speak. It's a great thing. You know, you, you don't have to write the script. I'll write the script. All you have to do is read the script in a sense. Don't be afraid of their faces. They're going to make faces. Don't, don't, don't be afraid of that. Just love me, says the Lord. And then what does he do? He touches his mouth. I put words in your mouth. I've given you something to say. And with me, in you, look at what he says. Look what's going to happen. We're going to root out. We're going to pull down, destroy, throw down, build, plant. Good, not you. It's me. Okay? You've been equipped. You will be trained. You will be trained. Here we go. Back to Exodus. Just reverse order here. Now you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So the Lord, here again, addresses Moses' concerns. I will teach you, and I'll continue to guide you. I will be with you, and I'm going to provide a helper for you. I'm going to provide you with Aaron, so that Aaron will be with you. And that it's not just, you're now all on your own. That's what we're going to be looking at in the context of the plurality of elders, the plurality of deacons. 
the consistory, the council. You're not on your own. You're not flying solo. I will train you. I will equip you. I'll be with you. And I will provide for you. Even the people that you need to have around you. Okay? The next thing, okay? You must take up. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That's what the Lord provides for us. If we're going to correct the, the paralysis that we have, we need to do exactly what we're doing tonight. We need to put on the armor of God. We need to recognize we have guys that have legitimate insecurity issues. And I'm not mocking when I say that. That's a good thing, right? It's a good thing that you say, I don't know. Okay, fine. I get that. Then that means on the front end, we need to do a lot better job of equipping and training. That's why we have this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. So you have put on that truth. You're, you're girding your waist. Your, your pants are going to stay up, right? Because why? You've been girded about with the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, right? Right? Before you go out there, gird yourself. Before you go out there, put on that breastplate. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So there you go. Confront the new problem, which is the old problem. The next thing that we're going to be looking at is that we conduct a taught ministry for a caught ministry. We're going to go a little bit quicker uh, through some of these, not quite as uh, detailed, but yeah, go ahead. The first part. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, we look for, for the best of the best. Um, I wonder if, if some uh, fear or insecurity comes from that idea. Is, isn't the purpose or the, the goal in looking for officers isn't it more like you look for certain gifts, not necessarily for the most gifted, but for the one gifted with leadership? I mean, do we make a tally of who has the most gifts, or do we say we need this in the church, so this is going to be our elder? Even so, we may be weak in speaking, and maybe we can... I mean, the best of the best makes a very unhealthy race. Yeah. In Corinthians 12. Yeah. Right? I mean... I, I think what, what McShane is getting at there and how, how I understand that in the context in which I quote it is that a lot of times what ends up being said, and, and for those of you who've been in the council room, y you can relate to this. Well, I know that he's not exactly the best, and I know that in an ideal situation we might not have him as an elder or a deacon, but we have four slots that we need to fill so we got to fill them. That's the context in which I, um, um, or that's the context in which McShane's quote resonates at least with, with me, is, is in that idea with that mentality. So I agree with you that, listen, not everyone is able to speak publicly, not everyone is able to um, um, do some of the more organizational things as well as other guys and everything else. I, I get that, I understand that. What we mean in terms of the best of the best is that we look at the, the, the body of the church that we have through 1 Timothy 3 and that we're looking at the church through that and saying we need qualified men that meet the best of the best, quote unquote, criteria of qualifications. Now we're going to be getting into the qualifications as, as we go along. But that, that's how I understand it, that you meet that, that baseline. I, I don't mean that. Um, like the baseline, not the yeah, 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 yeah. Not the. Is that clear? Does that that make sense? All right. Any other questions before I just put my head down and press on? Good. Clears mud. All right. Caught for uh, our taught ministry for a a caught ministry. So that's the second purpose for these educational um, sessions. And uh, what, what do I mean by that? As I was thinking this afternoon, just putting the slides together, um, uh, we already had our outline put together, but we had to put the slides together. And I was thinking, ah, I might want to put something here. But, uh, but this is what we're talking about here. Luke 24, 
you know, the men on the way to Emmaus. And they said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So you have these men being taught on the way to Emmaus. And they don't even, at this point, understand exactly, if you remember the, the, the story, they don't even know exactly who it is that is with them. Uh, but then the Lord opened up their eyes, and then that's where we pick it up. Did not our heart burn within us? But notice that, that as it's taught to them, the things of the Lord are taught to them, what do they do? They go to the eleven, they go to the people, and they say, this is what's going on. And they told about the things that had happened to them on the road and how he's known to them in the breaking of the bread. You can't help but read Luke 24, and, and you, you read it almost kind of fast because it's just it's, it's kind of a page-turner biblical story because there is this genuine love that these men have in their hearts for the things that they have learned and they're so excited about it they can't help but teach it. Some of you guys know because we have some younger guys here and uh, some older guys too but some of you know Rip Pratt. When I think of Rip Pratt from RYS this is the kind of guy that I think of. A man who has taught the ministry. A man who has taught the things of the Lord and he just oozes. He just, he just oozes in enthusiasm and it's a contagiousness that when you talk to him he just radiates with this godliness that he wants to share with people it doesn't matter who it is where you are what time it is rip i got three minutes i'm the main session speaker here i, I gotta talk well then brother let me just pray with you for a few minutes I'm like okay rip but i gotta go but anyway if you don't know rip you have no idea what i'm talking about but he is uh, we are certainly blessed to have him in in our churches um, are associated with our churches. Anyway, that's the kind of idea that we have here, and that's the purpose of this. And even though right now it might seem a bit academic and cold, we're hoping in the future we can have more discussion. Um, we're just trying to lay a foundation here to have something to build on. But hopefully, the church will be blessed by what we're doing here, so that as you get more enthusiastic about the work of the ministry and what God could potentially do on the corner of Baldwin and 20th through this little no-name church like Bethel, that we have an enthusiasm, that we're taught the ministry, and that we want to go out there and bring that ministry and show that enthusiasm. That's the idea. So we are taught to teach. And that's what we read, the biblical example is, in 2 Timothy 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's a self-propagating ministry. So ideally, anyone who takes this class should be able to teach the next class so that I can take the graduates from this class and we can learn something else so we don't have to go through this again. So Randy's smiling. Randy's going to be the one to teach this class to the next group of guys because we got a lot of guys who didn't show up tonight. So Randy gets to, right? That's what Paul is saying. The things that I taught to you, commit to faithful men so that they would be able to teach and they'd be able to teach. When you think about the expansion of the early church, Yes, of course, it's guided by the blessing of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit, as he used faithful men to actually sit down, take time, and go over these things. It's an amazing thing. The church spread like wildfire because the taught ministry is a caught ministry. That's what Scripture says. So, Paul says to young Timothy, this is what you got to do. Here's the pattern. Teach men, and so that they become teachers of men, and they become teachers of men, it starts going out. Beautiful thing. We are taught to teach. Being taught is simply part one. The idea is that this is ongoing task and function of those who have been taught, and then we teach to reach. That's the second thing we teach to reach. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The idea is not just that we have a bunch of learned people, but that we act like Christ and, according to Isaiah 40, we comfort God's people with God's comfort. Not our comfort. 
not what we think people should have for comfort, but God's comfort. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What words? God's words. That's the challenge that you and I have as we uh, go into the ministry, and, and the ministry being that of elder, deacon, pastor, right? that we comfort one another with the word of God. Because as men, we can be morons sometimes. And we can go, well, I wouldn't need to be comforted if that's me. So I don't know why he needs to be comforted. That's why I didn't make the visit. Or I, I don't know why she's sniveling about this. I don't think it's that big of a deal. We don't first think about ourselves and what I would want in that situation. And because I'm a simplistic person, I wouldn't want anything. I wouldn't want to be visited at the hospital. I hate people seeing me in a hospital bed. Why would I want that? So I didn't do that. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It's not interpreted through ourselves. It's interpreted through what God's word is supposed to be to people. Christ, Christ present among them. That's what it is all about. So we need to stop thinking only in terms of ourselves and, and, and our needs but rather think about the other person's needs. So we teach to reach. That's the idea uh, that we have there. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. It's not the same passage. It's a different passage, but it's the same idea in the same epistle. Comfort each other, but also, he adds, edify one another. And you're doing it. That's what he says, just as you are also doing. You're doing it. Keep it up. That's what he's saying. Keep it up. Keep doing this. This is what it's all about, that you teach to reach, right? So that you're edifying. You're building people up because that's what the idea of the church is. We're building each other up. We're strengthening each other so that people say, there is no way in the world I would ever not want to be a part of this. There's no way in the world I wouldn't want to invite my friend to this church. This is what this church is. This is what this church is about. They know... Um, each other and they love each other. The idea of these passages is that if we do not have an educated ministry in all the offices, the ministry will flounder. The church will flounder. It's not self-perpetuating. And not only is it not self-perpetuating, you don't have people that are all committed to it because there's no comfort. The comfort of God's word, where we come to get God's comfort and where we come to be built up. And this is why this is our second purpose. We need to overcome our insecurities so that the church might be comforted and edified. In one sense, God doesn't need us to distribute his comfort in the edifying nature of his promises, but he's committed himself to a certain method. And the method that he's committed himself to is using us, that he uses under shepherds to bring forward his shepherding ministry. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. How is the Lord my shepherd? Because well, he gives me a fuzzy feeling every now and again? No, the Lord's my shepherd because he sends under shepherds who take time with me and walk with me and talk with me and are concerned, okay? So this is why uh, we have this second thing. The taught ministry will, with God's help, be a caught ministry, okay? So that's the second main purpose that we wanted to look at. The third main purpose that we wanted to, to look at this evening for why we're doing all that we're doing, and that's all that we're doing tonight, just simply introduction. Um, why are we even doing this, okay? Well, because we want to construct an intentional foundation for uh, a long-term vision for the church at Bethel. Um, the church cannot just exist. Churches cannot just exist. This is one of the challenges that I think that, uh, that we face at Bethel. I think other churches face it too. Why do we do what we do? Well, because you're supposed to preach. You're supposed to have two worship services. You're supposed to uh, sing psalms. And, and we're supposed to occasionally sing hymns. And we're, we're supposed to do these things. That's why. If our vision for a church is simply built on the premise of that's what you're supposed to do. That's not good enough. There needs to be an intentional foundation for a long-term vision. Why do we preach these sermons? I've been thinking about this. Why am I preaching this series of sermons now? 
why are we preaching that series of sermons? Why are we going through this study? Why are we going to focus on, on that study for, for family night? Why do we need to have this kind of Bible study? Why do we need to have youth group? Why, why, why? Why do we have this stuff? We need to be asking those questions because our young people are going to ask those questions. And if we simply say, because that's what a church is supposed to do, that doesn't pay the bills. We need to have a long-term vision. Why do we do what we do? So yes, God's word has commanded this, and because that's how we fulfill the commission that he gives to us. So there are a number of different things in that we could look at in terms of this, but a church cannot simply exist. The book of Acts, we see how Antioch acted with intentionality. They didn't simply say, let's have a mission program. No, they acted with intentionality. They had a missionary, Paul. And from Paul, they sent him out. And he was sent out in a particular way, with a particular mentality, with an intentional vision for how the church is going to grow. Now, I won't preach the whole um, series on the book of Acts again. But, right, Paul traveled with intentionality. Christ gave an organized program of outreach to the church. It wasn't just... Go and do something. Go and make disciples. There was an intentionality that this is how you do it, right? You begin at Jerusalem. You go to Samaria. Then you go to the ends of the earth. How are we living with an intentionality in terms of the things uh, that we do? Um, think of a tree in, in this sense. I think that's in your notes there. Think of a tree in that sense. There are, there are to the tree, right? There are many roots. And so to the many roots of the one tree, right? We have a leadership vision. All right, how are we going to pep per perpetuate uh, ministry in the church? How are we going to perpetuate leadership? How are we going to perpetuate leadership? It's funny, kind of a side note here, but I was talking recently about uh, someone about the organ. I happen to be on the music committee of our church, and boy, man, we don't have a lot of people in organ lessons right now, right? So if we don't do something, it won't be long, and we're just going to go, well, that, that's a nice organ, but we only play the piano. I'm not saying that that's the worst thing in the world or anything else, but I'm saying if you want to keep something going, you need to invest in it. If you're going to invest in it, then you need to pull some people aside and say, listen, if we need to pay for lessons, and we need to pay for lessons or whatever we need to do, but if we want to perpetuate this, you better start thinking about it because it's not, it, it's not going to just happen. You need to perpetuate it, right? Okay, leadership vision. What kind of leadership vision do we have? What kind of active role are we developing? So we have a class once a year. Is that, is that what we want? Is, is that what's going to perpetuate our vision? Well, I don't know. What kind of leadership do we want in our church? Well, I don't know. We've never even talked about that. We just have elders, and then we just have deacons, and then we just do church, and, and it just it's always happened. It's always worked out. I, I don't know. Well, it's not always going to work out. What are we doing? How are we thinking about this? Educational vision. Why do we have education? Why do we have Sunday school? Why do we have catechism class? Why do we have youth group? How does our youth group work in conjunction with our catechism? How does our catechism, how does our catechism work in conjunction with Sunday school? Is Sunday school preparing them for catechism? And then what's catechism preparing them for? What about profession of faith? Where, do, where does that fit in? Dan, we were talking about that earlier before, before, right? Profession of faith and how does this all work? Okay, where does this all fit in? How does this function within the life of our church? I don't know if this is the next one. It's not the next one. Let me quick go to this one. The facility vision. Tom knows, because Tom's on education. Tom knows every time we meet for educational meeting, we quickly become what other committee? Building and Grounds Committee. Every time, without fail, we become Building and Grounds Committee because we go, yeah, but if we do that, boy, it would really be nice if we had a room so we could set up tables like this with a, with, with a, with a machine and a, and a screen so we can actually do this kind of thing, but we don't have that. But man, that would be helpful. And boy, you know what we need for our young people in our youth group? We have nowhere to go. Gary's house is lovely, but it's getting too small, and we don't want to buy Gary another house, so we'd rather maybe do something with, with the church here. But how does the, how's, how does the church work with that? And the cadet room that we have, what's going on with the cadet room? And, and the girls' club program that we have, we just kind of put them over there in a corner, we put them over there in a corner. And, and how is the facility working? How does the facility work with our educational vision and what we want to do? And how does that meet with our congregational vision? 
too often things in the life of the church become ad hoc. They, they just, it just happens. Well, why does it just happen? Where do we want to be in five years? I don't know, but I hope God's with us. Well, I do too, but, but are we thinking? Are we planning? Are we, are, we, are we just waiting for it to passively happen? Right? To construct an intentional foundation. Why are we doing this? Why this discussion? Why the men, the leadership of the church? Why do we sit down like this? Because I think it's good to have these talks. Now, uh, we have so much other stuff, we're not going to be able to get to this, but I want to at least uh, tantalize you with, with the prospect of having these discussions because we got a, a lot of other basics we need, we need to do. But we got a lot of different roots that we can talk about because all these roots come together and do what? The many roots make one, one tree. And it's through the many roots that the tree stands. And it stands tall. And that it's able to to grow. It's able to withstand. It stands and withstands. And it's able to grow. When you have a healthy root system, only then is that one singular tree able to grow, stand, and withstand the various things that come upon it. He shall be, and I know that this is Psalm 1, it's speaking of the individual here, but we can think of this perhaps in terms of the church then as well. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Well, the question is, how is he going to get to the water? How does the tree get to the water? Through the roots, and through the roots come the fruits. So this intentional long-term vision that we develop an understanding of the church that leads us to, to, to think and reflect on why do we do what we do? Why do we have, from a facility standpoint even, why do we have what we have? How are we growing and developing as a congregation? That's why Education Committee, that's why we have this family conference. This is our feeble attempt in a sense. Um, it's not a feeble thing, but it's a feeble attempt to start saying, congregation, we need to start thinking in terms of the generational commitment to our church so that we can grow this and establish this. All right, that brings me to our proposed pattern, and that was the second thing that we we're going to look at this evening. So that brings us to 8 o'clock on the nose, by the way. 8 o'clock and 30 seconds. So let's break there. First, are there any questions? Any questions? Any feedback? Although I just said let's break, so any question you just had, you totally chucked at the prospect of getting hot coffee in a hot room. Anyway, Gary, is your hand partially up or you're just, no. you're just tired, you're bored? <laughs> How's it working out for you? <laughs> Not very well. There was one chair that was cracked right in the middle and when you sit in it, it opened up. And then when you stand up, it, it, it pinches. So <laughs> as a ministry to you all, I took that one out. I hit it somewhere among you. Okay, any, any questions you guys have? Anything? Okay, otherwise, go ahead, grab some coffee. Let's come back in about three minutes, and the next section that we have doesn't take near as long.